now, an eighth special presentation. In this edition of Art Beat Nation, a sculptor recreates his memories in clay. My mind could do a lot of things once I got the clay in my hand. It just occupied my time. Maneuver through abstract art. Abstract artists have their own language. Learn about the Western art of rawhide braiding. It's a very detailed and a very precise art. And see why glass blowing is so rewarding for one artist. What I like to do is create colored glass objects that take on their own dimension. It's all ahead on this edition of Art Beat Nation. Funding for Art Beat Nation is made possible by contributions to eight from viewers like you. Thank you. Gary Dudley, a ceramic artist, grew up with clay in his hands. Now it's his passion. He takes memories, turns them into sculptures, and then casts them in bronze. Watch as Dudley takes us through his creative process. Hi, I'm Gary Dudley. I work on the name Garley. I'm a sculptor. Well, my first experience was my mother was, uh, she did ceramics. So I used to travel with her just to carry her stuff. I'm eight, nine, she just dragging me along. I don't want to go. So once she gets to where she's doing her work, the way she used to keep me quiet was to just give me some clay. But I just remember the first time she gave me the clay was just an amazing thing for me because my mind could do a lot of things once I got the clay in my hand. It just occupied my time. And so everything went silent for me at that point. I grew up in Portsmouth, Virginia, segregated at the time. And believe it or not, a lot of people don't understand that even in segregation, there is, the culture is just a beautiful culture. So a lot of things in my mind I like to remember by sculpting how beautiful people seemed to me, even in a time where you would think it would be the culture itself. Just look at the, the underlying part of culture. There's families, families that go to church, families that, you know, raising their kids to go to school. And that's the part I remember. That's the part I'm trying to capture. In some cases, it's just pushing on the clay. Sometimes, sometimes I don't have an idea. Sometimes I'm pushing on clay and then the idea com comes to me. Other times, uh, like the piece uh, that I used my daughter as the model, Sunday's Flower. When I started that piece, I didn't have my daughter in mind, actually. But I needed a child's face, and my daughter was five at the time, and I went, that face will work for me. And that was a tough one, because she, she was five, and the only way I could get her to sit still was to put cartoons on. The skateboarder is a little bit different, uh, because I've had Someone sent me a photograph uh, of a skateboarder, and I, and I just, I looked at that and I said, that's a dynamic piece. Someone asked me, do you plan your sculptures? Well, yes, but those plans usually <laughs> go out the window. Do you draw a picture of your sculptures? I did that in the beginning where I said, okay, I'm sketch this part and then put this together. But what happens is, for me, I was struggling trying to stay in the sketch. I want people to just come in and go, I like it, I don't like it, and it's okay not to like it. Move on and then find something you do like. That's, that's what art is. Don't try to judge what someone else is saying art is. And that's, I think that's where we are today. A lot of times someone else is waiting for someone else to tell them whether or not they like this piece of art. Is that okay? It's okay if you feel that, like, if you like it, it's okay. For me, uh, when I started it, it was just a success already. And yes, you know, you want to have all the actors. You want to be the great artist, and, and that's, I'm still working on that. But most artists would tell you when they create, that's a success. To be able to just start something from nothing and to make it happen is just a great feeling. Everything else after that is icing on the cake. 
To see more of Dudley's sculptures, visit GaryLeeSculptures.com. Jason Rolfe, an abstract artist, wants viewers to navigate their way through his art. Rolf draws inspiration from his everyday surroundings and uses layers of different materials to create his works, guiding viewers on an artistic journey. Abstract artists have their own language. It's non-representational. So you're describing and activating a, a space, a two-dimensional space with, with any mark making you want that doesn't have to show depth or light or form. And all those things are the rules of a traditional landscape or still life or a portrait don't exist. My name is Jason Rolfe. I am an artist from Brooklyn, New York. I was born in Milwaukee in 1970. My parents were, were young hippies here and we've lived all over the state of Wisconsin until I went to college here in, in Milwaukee at UWM. And after about 10 years of making art in Milwaukee, we had a loft down on um, Old World 3rd Street by the Bradley Center. And we moved to uh, Brooklyn about 15 years ago and that's been our home ever since. The full name of the exhibit is Navigational Aids and I was really thinking about the things that help guide you through your decision-making process. And right now in the information age, we get a lot of conflicting information. So you'll get an inf a piece of information that, that takes you to what you want to do, and then you'll get a piece of information that might lead you away from that. And then it's up to you as an individual to reconcile those two experiences and, and then make your decision. And I think the, the way the work looks is there's a lot of information coming at you, and then you as a viewer figure out your way to navigate through that space. I love it when magical mistakes occur in a painting. The inspiration comes from just about everything that I experience in my day to day. So it could be a construction site, it could be um, some piece of graffiti on the street, it could be like a sticker that's slowly eroding, and just seeing the, the different layers of how everybody interacts with their environment. And then trying to capture that as a feeling. I'm not really illustrating it, but I'm more trying to get the essence of it. And I wanted to kind of have that growing and decaying and growing and decaying. And a lot of that is, is almost a combination of what I experienced here in, in Wisconsin and out in Brooklyn, where things sort of age and rust and patina, and then they're repainted and, and re, you know, re-sanded and, and reclaimed. And I wanted to show that whole transition process happening in the new work. I'll start with a, with a raw panel or a, a, a canvas panel and start to add layers of, of collage and thick impasto layers of paint where the, the paint almost looks like cake frosting. And then I will start to um, incise, I'll draw into the back of the paint with a paintbrush and I'll start adding layers of tape and cut pieces of paper collage and it starts building up. Once I've got what I think is the outermost layer, I will start to sand and, and use razor blades to, to sculpt back into the painting and reveal the things that once had been hidden underneath. There's a star-like pattern that I use that, that is more like a wind star or a compass rose. Some of these images feel like, like lunar landscapes, like a, a, a survey of a, of a planet where there'll be sort of like geographical markers. Um, some feel like, like um, a map where you'll have like a little designation, a dot for where an intersection is or a population center is. And I like taking all of those symbols and taking them out of their original context and then putting them in as a, as a visual element. So people who are engineers or, or map makers will look at these things and they kind of have a feeling that they've seen this stuff before, but I'm using it almost for its aesthetic quality. The birds were always a little um, side project my, my studio here on 3rd Street in Milwaukee when I started making the birds was on the second floor right at the tree line and the birds were always sort of hopping around in our windowsills or in our window boxes. And then I realized that I kind of wanted to draw the birds interacting with the paintings. And so now I've made the inside of the bird mimic whatever the subject matter is in the abstract paintings. So it's as if the birds have seen the abstract paintings, gotten back together, and now they're having a conversation about what they experienced. A favorite painting for an artist might be different than a favorite painting for the viewer. 
Uh, my favorite paintings are the ones that were the most challenging, that maybe gave me the most trouble. Uh, the, the squeaky wheel gets the grease sort of thing. You know, sometimes there's a painting that, that just was not coming together in the way you imagined it, and then you make those last few decisions that it just starts to, to glow. And then there's a piece we used for the show card called The Fortune Teller that was really resisting being done for many, many, many months. And then when we um, decided to use it for the show card and we came up with a title, all these, these really disparate elements came together to give us something that you know, I, I felt very proud for. And when you put something on the show card, usually that's your, that's your darling. You know, that's sort of the, 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 the bright star. In the digital age, it really, I think, is important to remember that, that things are, can be made with your hands and that somebody stood over a table with, with tape and paint and brushes and, and tools and actually constructed something from nothing to step away from, from your desk or from your day-to-day -day and just to come and, and ponder on something visual that's in front of you that was actually made by another person. That that, that person is, is bringing something that the only purpose of that object is to give you something to reflect on and look at and, and conceive new ideas and, and react to. That would have to be my, my joy, is that there's still somebody out there actually you know, doing something with their hands and bringing it to a viewer to come and experience. Learn more at jasonrolf.tumblr.com. The Western art of rawhide braiding might be dying out, but for Tim George, a master of the craft, it's still very much alive. Take a look at his detail-oriented art. This is a calf hide that's been made into rawhide. We'll start cutting a string around in a circle about one and a quarter inches. My name is Tim George. I'm a rawhide braider and have braided for over 35 years. We're gonna have to reintroduce moisture to it so that I can cut it. And it'll take about three days before it's ready to cut. When I was a young man, I started to buckaroo and I met a man, Red Oster, who repaired saddles and did some simple braiding on the side. And one day he was in there braiding a riata and every time he'd go to pull a string tight, he'd bump into me. And he said, if I was gonna stand around here in the way, I might as well learn something. Okay, once our hide is ready to cut, first what we're gonna do is we're gonna start splitting it down or bringing it into one consistent thickness. And we're gonna use the old Osborne 86 here. I grew up in Elkton over on the Oregon coast. And then when I came over to Eastern Oregon in 75, I just fell right into it, and I've been there ever since. But when I go to the coast, a depression sets on me. And it's not until I come back over the mountain and feel my whole body just go, <sighs> I'm home. This is my country. Still, Tim hasn't left the ocean behind entirely. Western rawhide braiding grew out of the knots sailors have been tying for centuries. And folks in Pendleton will tell you that Tim makes some of the finest examples of the work anywhere. Braiding is not uncommon. If you go to Southeast Oregon, uh, Paisley, Fields, uh, Jordan Valley, that kind of country, you see people braiding. Tim has taken that cowboy art to the, to the ultimate level. I don't believe there's, there's more than 10 people in the world that can braid at the level that Tim does. Like the sailors before them, original rawhide braiders took up the craft out of a practical need. Most of it was developed by the vaquero, coming up through Argentina, Mexico. Whenever they had time off in the evening or whatever, let's say they wanted to plait a rope, if they had a need for a head stall, a set of reins, then they would just sit down and basically make the functioning pieces that they needed. The material to make the gear was also ready to hand. 
rawhide is merely the cowhide, an elk hide, horse hide, with nothing more than the hair and the flesh removed, where leather is a chemically treated process. And rawhide is 10 times stronger than leather is. It won't dry rot, it'll stay in this condition literally forever. This practical craft evolved into an art form, and most of Tim's work now goes straight to collectors. We're now going to split it down to a 32nd of an inch. This is a 32nd of an inch, and then we'll cut you one a 64th of an inch. Tim's renown is earned by the care he takes with every step of this demanding process. Now we're ready to bevel the edge of the string. This just takes that little sharp edge off. The string is too small to run through the splitter, so Tim does this step by hand. Just to be clear, that string is a 64th of an inch wide. Okay, at this point, it too is ready to be braided in a knot. Say, could you do that with your left hand? Yes, ma'am. Now this is pure showmanship here. You did that with your left hand. Well, that's what you wanted. <laughs> as exacting and exhausting as the process is already, it's all still just preparation for the actual braiding. Today, Tim is braiding a quirt, a Spanish-style flexible whip. The barrel of the quirt is 24 strings, and then we have these series of knots, and so we might take it to an under four, over four. They're here, we're actually up over seven and eight strings. Okay, now at this point, where we're starting to raise it from under one over one to under two over two, or we're simply increasing the diameter of the knot. Now that we're going under three, we're gonna go over two under one. If you're lost already, you'll be forgiven. But Tim insists that it's actually pretty simple. The Turk's head is the foundation of all of these knots. I can increase it to a larger Turk's head, or at this point, I can start interweaving it. Let me do it left-handed too. Very funny. But even if rawhide braiding is simple enough to do with your non-dominant hand, Tim is the first to admit that this art form is not for everyone. It's a very detailed and a very precise art. If you don't love working with your hands, you don't have the time or the patience, you simply aren't gonna make it. So I really have to focus on what I'm doing to be able to keep everything straight, get everything to fit like it is without making any mistakes. So what happens when he does make a mistake? <sighs> Not only can I tie sailor's knots, I can cuss and curse like one too. <laughs> Tim is a master of the classical Western style, but he's also pretty handy at the South American gaucho style. This kind of braiding requires a tool known as a fid to separate the fine strings as Tim braids them. The gaucho style is more artistic than ours, but it doesn't have the durability that ours does because of the fineness of the string. And then of course, if it gets flipped over, you gotta pull it out and start all over again. You probably aren't gonna wanna stay here until this is done because we'll be at it for several hours. <laughs> This art form takes time. And it might be for this reason more than any other that it's now in danger of dying out. We're in a computer age. We want it now. We've got to see it now. We don't have the patience that a craftsman needs. We just don't have that anymore. For Tim George, Eastern Oregon's open spaces and more relaxed pace of life are the ingredients he needs to keep this vanishing art form alive. To me, it's worth the time. I just love working with my hands and the idea that I take a cowhide and make an article that is going to last a long, long time, be here long after I'm gone.
The art of glass blowing is more complex than one may think. Artisan Steven Monser observes that unlike painters who can paint, stop, and come back to their canvas later, glass blowing is a time-sensitive art. What I try to do is, in my own way, I, I'm not trying to recreate the wheel. It's already it's been done. What I like to do is create colored glass objects that take on their own dimension. I look into the, the vat of clear 2100 degree glass, and it's sort of like a palette. It can be anything you want it to be. It can be a, a vessel, it can be a plate, it can be a bowl, it can be a paperweight. You can take clear glass, and it's all around us all day long, people don't even notice glass, and just turn into something that's really beautiful, really amazing. I don't know how else to describe it, it's just so rewarding when it comes out with a finished product and you can really be proud of it. Glass is very delicate, you have to, to bring it up to temperature very slowly, so it takes about 24 to 26 hours to get it up to 2100 degrees, it's a process. A fire pit keeps it hot. It's sort of like a drippy honey type thing on the pipe. You take it to the bench, you work it, and as it cools, you have to reheat it so you can work it again. It goes from 2100 down to say 1400 where it won't work anymore, and then you have to reheat it. You add color, and your finished product ends up in an, what we call an annealer, which will take about 12 hours to cool it down to room temperature so it doesn't crack. It sounds involved, but there's a method to each piece. Focus is really important, because you're focusing on what you're doing, and then you also have to remember what comes next. And you really have to pay attention, because we're working with 2,100 degree glass, and so you have to, in a way, try to relax mentally, but on the other hand, you're given a certain amount of time, about a minute and a half, to work it. So there's the coordination of patience, but hurry up because it's getting cold, that type of thing. To me, glass blowing is very rewarding because it takes so long to do, so long to learn, and there's so much involved, and I think that's what draws me to it. It's not the simple, sometimes I envy people that can just paint because you can take your easel and just paint and you can stop and come back where this has a little more complexity to it, which is probably why I'm drawn to it more. My parents took me to the Corning Museum of Glass when I was a kid, and we had colored glass in the house and for the windows, and it just, that experience kind of stuck with me for quite a while, and um, I've always been drawn to it. Some people ask me what it's like to blow glass or what it feels like, and, and it's really a hard thing to describe how, how it feels and I, I say, well, have you ever seen a dog with his head out the window? That's sort of what it feels like. You can't really explain it, but it's just a very good feeling of doing it. For more arts and culture, visit azpbs.org slash artbeat, where you'll find feature videos and information on the Arizona arts scene. Funding for Artbeat Nation is made possible by contributions to eight from viewers like you. Thank you.